Late October 2012, the northeastern United States was preparing for one of the most unusual and extreme natural disasters seen in recent memory. Hurricane Sandy, one of the largest hurricanes in the North Atlantic in recorded history, was in the process of becoming an extratropical cyclone and was about to take a leftward turn and slam into the northeast coast of the United States. The situation was dire. Storms surge anywhere from 8 to 11 feet across portions of the northeast coast, with the expectation of major flooding occurring in New England. Government officials on all levels were sounding the alarm. Sandy was not to be underestimated. Despite the urgent warnings from government officials to the residents to get out while they could, the attitude from the potential impacts from Sandy was not the same for some residents in New England. There is a shirtless man <laughs> jogging wearing a horse mask. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what that's all about. A lot of people were refusing to leave for Sandy, with many having a similar sentiment regarding their decision to ride out the storm. The source of that sentiment was what occurred the year prior in August of 2011, Hurricane Irene. Hurricane Irene was a source of frustration for many people in the Northeast, with locals claiming that the storm did not do much damage outside of what it did to upstate New York, Vermont, and New Hampshire, and feeling that Sandy, at least for the coastline, was going to just be a repeat of Irene. However, Irene was anything but a weak storm. In fact, Irene broke numerous records in the Northeastern United States, and its significance is often understated, downplayed by the general public when referring to the damage Irene caused, at least outside of what it did in Vermont. Today, I will look at Hurricane Irene, its origins, its track and forecast, the preparations made for the storm, what the storm did, the misinformation surrounding Irene's impacts, and how Irene's perceived shortcomings contributed to the public response of Hurricane Sandy. Welcome to Nature's Fury. The Atlantic hurricane season before Irene was nothing remarkable. Eight tropical storms had occurred by this point in time, most of them being relatively weak, with tropical storms Brett and Cindy being the strongest storms before Irene, both topping out with winds of 70 miles per hour. In terms of activity, the North Atlantic hurricane season of 2011 was average so far. Typically, the Atlantic hurricane season does not see much activity in June and July. The first system for 2011 was Arlene, which formed in late June. The first half of July was utterly silent, but once the second half of July rolled around, there was a flurry of activity that kept forecasters on their toes. The season was quiet, a bit too quiet to some. No hurricanes yet by mid-August. And yet, just off the coast of Africa, a tropical wave was beginning its journey, which would take it from Africa to the Caribbean Sea and up the eastern seaboard of the United States, which would solidify its name in the minds of those in its path. Though, real quick, not a lot of people who like these videos are subscribed to the channel, so if you enjoy these videos, consider subscribing. It helps me a lot and tells me I'm doing something right. Also, I have a Discord server I talk infrequently. Link in the description. Uh, yeah, enough self-promotion. Back to Irene. On August 15th, a tropical wave exited the coast of Western Africa, accompanied by a large area of clouds and thunderstorms. Over the next couple of days, the convection associated with the storm would diminish south of the Cape Verde Islands. However, the system would continue to have a well-defined mid-level circulation. As the system moved westward, convection would return and eventually the system would become better organized in between the Cape Verde Islands and the Lesser Antilles on August 17th. As the system continued moving westward, more and more interest was put into the system. On August 20th, Recon Aircraft flew into the storm for a routine checkup on its development. Recon Aircraft found multiple instances of winds ranging from 40 to 45 knots, but was unable to find a close center of circulation. Shortly before 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on August 20th, Recon found the center of circulation at the southern edge of convection. Thus, at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, the system was named Irene. The expectation was that Irene would intensify due to little shear and the warm waters of the Caribbean. Irene would travel through the Caribbean Sea, with the initial forecasts expecting Irene to move through the islands of Hispaniola and Cuba, then move into Florida. However, Irene's forecast regarding its location would change over the next few days, which I will go over later. With the original forecast in mind, tropical storm warnings were issued for many islands in the Greater and Lesser Antilles and Puerto Rico itself, 
a hurricane watch was put in place for the southern portion of the Dominican Republic. Preparations were primarily in the Antilles and in Puerto Rico. Airports and seaports were closed due to Irene in the Antilles, with emergency shelters being opened up in the Virgin Islands and in Puerto Rico. At this time, Irene was already impacting the Lesser Antilles. Damage in the Lesser Antilles was minimal, although British billionaire Richard Branson's mansion was burned to the ground due to a lightning strike from Irene. Low-lying areas got flooded and flights were cancelled. The worst of the storm in the Lesser Antilles came from Irene's outer bands. As the storm moved through the Lesser Antilles, Irene's forecast changed with the expectation now being that Irene would make a direct landfall in Puerto Rico and move north of Hispaniola. Irene continued moving towards the northwest, making landfall in Puerto Rico as a strong tropical storm on August 22nd at 1.35 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, with winds of 70 miles per hour. Irene strengthened into a hurricane while over the island, although the island never experienced hurricane force winds due to the winds being located north of the island. Not to say that the winds were anything to scoff at, Governor Luis Fortuno declared a state of emergency for the island, with Irene cutting power to over a million people in Puerto Rico. The amount of flooding damage in Puerto Rico was extensive. A majority of the western side of the island got roughly 10 inches of rainfall, with isolated areas of 15 to 20 inches of rainfall. Unfortunately, Irene claimed the life of one person in Puerto Rico, and many areas across the island were left without electricity and water for a prolonged period of time. After Irene moved over Puerto Rico, Irene was forecasted to strengthen further and potentially become a major hurricane south of the Bahamas, before hitting the eastern coast of the United States. Irene's strengthening trend was expected to continue as Irene missed making landfall in Hispaniola, although Irene's close proximity to the mountains of the island is thought to have limited its intensification in retrospect. As Irene passed north of Hispaniola, models became more consistent in their forecasts of what Irene would do when it would approach the United States. What was expected was something historic. Irene was expected to move through the Bahamas, then move nearly due north, make landfall in the Carolinas, and, while retaining status as a hurricane, move toward and through the northeastern United States. As a result, people started panicking. In order to understand the very extreme messaging regarding Irene's projected impacts of the Northeast and why people were panicking, we need to talk about some history regarding tropical cyclones and the Northeast. Typically, when tropical cyclones move northward from the Caribbean Sea and near the eastern coast of the United States, tropical cyclones tend to hug the eastern seaboard of the United States, but are often pulled back out to sea in a process called recurving which usually keeps storms far offshore of the northeastern United States. What typically causes most tropical cyclones to be pulled away from the New England coastline is a strong ridge located in the eastern Atlantic that is present throughout most of hurricane season, the Bermuda High. The Bermuda High plays a vital role in the steering currents that affect how and where tropical cyclones travel when they develop in the North Atlantic. But the keyword in that sentence two sentences ago was typically. The Bermuda High changes often in terms of strength and positioning, meaning there are instances where the Bermuda High doesn't pull tropical cyclones out to sea as it normally would. So what exactly happened in the case of Irene? The Bermuda High was expected to move eastward while Irene was moving through the Bahamas and Irene would parallel the coast of Florida. At the same time, a developing trough would develop across the eastern United States, creating a steering pattern that would act as a funnel, pushing Irene up the coastline in a nearly straight line to the north-northeast, potentially keeping hurricane strength as it did so. What also didn't help was the last time the northeastern United States experienced a hurricane landfall was Hurricane Bob in 1991 in Rhode Island. More specific to near New York City, the last time a hurricane made landfall near New York City was Hurricane Gloria of 1985. Generally speaking for the Northeast, it had been 20 to 25 years since a hurricane made landfall in the region. As a result, people started to go absolutely insane about what Irene would do. As Irene was expected to move nearly due north along the eastern seaboard of the United States, Governors up and down the coast quickly started issuing states of emergency in advance of Irene. 
the governors of North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Washington, D.C., Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine all issued states of emergency in preparation for Irene. Hurricane warnings would then be issued for the states along the coast as Irene moved closer ashore. Irene was expected to bring winds of at least hurricane force to most of the mid-Atlantic and northeastern states, and storm surge ranging from 6 to 9 feet across the eastern seaboard, with elevated levels of storm surge totals of up to 11 feet predicted for North Carolina. Rainfall totals of at least 5 inches were predicted across a majority of the northeast and the mid-Atlantic. Like I said at the end of the last segment of the video, people were panicking over what Irene was supposedly going to cause. In the worst case scenario, Irene could be a multi-billion dollar damaging storm wreaking havoc in the northeastern United States. In the best case scenario, Irene could be a multi-billion dollar damaging storm wrecking havoc in the northeastern United States. The messaging regarding Irene's impacts was extreme. Irene was expected to be the worst storm in the northeast in recent memory and people reacted about as well as one would expect. With a total of 65 million people in the projected path for Irene, evacuation orders were issued up and down the coastline from North Carolina to New York. New York specifically had never issued a mandatory evacuation order for a natural disaster before. In total, two and a half million people were in the evacuation zone ahead of Irene, mainly in the Northeast. The message from government officials was clear. Get out while you still can, because we cannot guarantee we can send people out to save you. In other words, staying would put you at the mercy of Hurricane Irene's power. Many across the areas where Irene was expected to bring its wrath to heeded the warning to evacuate. The massive evacuation orders resulted in massive traffic jams as long as 20 miles across the Northeast, and gas stations in New Jersey and New York ran out of gasoline. Shelters were open for those who were unable to leave or for those who did not want to leave across the states expected to receive impacts from Irene. Those who didn't evacuate for Irene, believing the storm was not going to be as bad as anticipated or just couldn't evacuate for other reasons, began gathering essential supplies and began boarding up their windows. In New York City, the subway system was shut down in anticipation for Irene. The first time the subway system in New York City was ever shut down due to an incoming natural disaster. Many major cities across the Northeast followed suit, shutting down transportation systems, and in the case of Atlantic City, all casinos were shut down due to Irene. People were expecting the worst to occur, and undoubtedly so, the messaging from everyone was expecting the worst case scenario. At this time, however, Irene was peaking in intensity in the Bahamas, and was about to begin its journey through the eastern seaboard of the United States. As people in the United States were freaking out over Irene's potential impacts, people in the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos Islands had already finished preparing for the storm. Irene moved through the Turks and Caicos Islands as a Category 1 hurricane, knocking out power to many people across the British Isles, with a central minimum pressure of 957 millibars. Irene would bring Category 3 winds to the Bahamas. The areas affected by Irene were heavily damaged by the strong winds and flooding, which caused massive devastation, specifically along Cat Island, Rum Cay, Crooked Island, Ackland, and Mayaguana. Thankfully, the New Providence and Grand Bahama Islands escaped the worst of Irene. The National Emergency Management Agency for the Bahamas stated that 90% of the settlement of Lovely Bay in the Acklands had been wiped out. Rainfall totals of at least 13 inches was reported across portions of the Bahamas, with the most damage seeming to be credited to the high winds associated with Irene. A reported wind gust of 140 miles per hour was reported in the Bahamas as Irene moved through. Irene was expected to continue to intensify but Irene did the exact opposite, as it started to weaken slowly when it moved over Long Island in the Bahamas. As Irene moved through the Bahamas on August 25th and exited on the 26th, its winds would continue to decrease, but its pressure would also decrease as well. The minimum central pressure for Irene reached its lowest point at 2am Eastern Daylight Time, with a pressure 
of 942 millibars. As Irene tracked northward, hurricane warnings would begin to be issued for the eastern coast of the United States. From August 26th through the 27th, Irene seemed to be going through an eyewall replacement cycle, which, when completed, would increase the radius of the winds observed with the storm at the cost of a decrease in wind speed. Irene never completed the eyewall replacement cycle, which ended up being both a blessing and a curse to those in its path. Irene would continue northward, passing off the coasts of Georgia and Florida, all while slowly weakening. At 8 a.m. on August 27th, Irene would make landfall near Cape Lookout, North Carolina as a Category 1 hurricane, with winds of 85 miles per hour. The strongest winds with Irene were observed east of the center of the storm, which would be a trend that was expected to continue throughout the rest of its lifetime. A maximum storm surge for Irene was observed at Oregon Inlet Mariana, North Carolina, just before midnight on August 27th, with a storm surge of 7.09 feet. However, post-storm survey suggests values of 8 to 11 feet within portions of Pamlico Sound in North Carolina. The maximum rainfall in North Carolina would be observed in Bayboro, with a rainfall total of 15.74 inches. The worst damage in North Carolina was in between Cape Hatteras and Oregon Inlet. As Irene moved through the outer banks of North Carolina, Irene barely missed the Delmarva Peninsula. However, the Hampton Roads area of the peninsula from Ocean City, Maryland southward had surge flooding comparable to Isabel 2003. At 5.45 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on August 28th, Irene made landfall at Brigginton Island in New Jersey. Yet again, the strongest winds were east of the center. From this point, Irene would bring storm surge of 4 to 6 feet for the northeastern United States. The Jersey Shore specifically saw storm surge of 3 to 5 feet, causing some beach erosion. Pennsylvania and New Jersey saw record-breaking river crests due to flooding from Irene due to heavy rainfall associated with Irene with rainfall totals ranging from 4 to 6 inches in the area. As Irene accelerated northward, the storm kept weakening. A couple hours after Irene made landfall in New Jersey, Irene would make landfall directly over New York City, one of only a handful of storms that have made direct landfall in New York City. Even with winds down to 65 miles per hour, Irene caused storm surge ranging from 3 to 6 feet in the area causing hundreds of millions of dollars in property damages in the area and knocking out power for 3 million people across New York City, Long Island, and Connecticut. And yet, the worst of Irene for the United States was just about to occur. Irene was a weakening tropical storm. However, Irene would end up causing some of the worst flooding in upstate New York and in Vermont in recent memory. In less than 24 hours, Irene dumped up to 8 inches of rain across upstate New York, Vermont, and New Hampshire. Irene's large size aided in the rainfall totals as well, but Irene's wrath in Vermont is what the storm is most well known for. Irene's flooding in Vermont has got on record as being one of the worst flooding disasters in the state's history, only comparable to the floods of November 1927. In Vermont, nearly 2,400 roads, 800 homes, 300 bridges, and half a dozen railroad tracks were destroyed in total. The storm also left three towns in the Catskill Mountains in New York completely uninhabitable after the floods. When people remember the worst of Irene, they tend to remember the flooding in Vermont, and for good reason. The flash flooding potential with Irene was high with the storm, and yet, the outcome of Irene's flooding was worse than anticipated for many inland areas. After passing through the Northeast, Irene became an extratropical cyclone and later got absorbed into a cold front system on August 30th in northeastern Canada. During Irene's time in the United States, nine tornadoes touched down associated with Irene, the strongest being an EF2 in North Carolina. As Irene moved away from the states, people were now able to see the damage firsthand left from Irene. Irene's worst damage was caused due to flooding across the areas it tracked. In North Carolina, over 1,100 homes were destroyed due to Irene. Further north in New Jersey, thousands of people were left without power for over a week. Ultimately, over a million people in New Jersey were left without power due to Irene at one point or another. Record rainfall totals were observed in New Jersey due to Irene. 
with Freehold, New Jersey reaching a maximum total of 11.27 inches of rainfall. However, southern New Jersey was left with little damage due to Irene's winds being further to the east. In the New York City metro area, 3 million people had power knocked out, and storm surge of 3 to 5 feet in the area caused hundreds of millions of dollars in damages. The subway system did not flood during Irene, but it got very close to doing so, within a foot of the subway system. Not as bad as expected, but Irene didn't do nothing in the area. Rail transit operations were shut down between New York and New Jersey for almost three months due to flooding of the Ramapo River. A little bit to the north of New York City, sewage treatment plants were overwhelmed, with at least 52 municipalities in the Hudson Valley citing raw sewage spills being observed in those areas. The worst damage was observed in upstate New York, Vermont, and New Hampshire due to excessive flooding. Other areas of New England, such as Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Maine, saw severe flooding as a result from the rains of Irene. The damage in the Caribbean was also a cause for concern. The worst of the damage was observed in Puerto Rico and in the Bahamas, with the rainfall in Puerto Rico reaching over 10 inches for portions of the island, and with many people losing access to clean water and electricity. The Bahamas saw extensive damage in the southern islands, with the worst damage being in the Acklands. Irene would be retired by the World Meteorological Organization and then replaced with Irma, which only got used once because Irma... because Irma. In total, Irene cost $14.8 billion in damages across its lifetime, with most of the damages in the United States. And in total, 48 people lost their lives to Irene. So, when Sandy happened the next year, a decent portion of the population did not evacuate, citing Irene doing nothing as to why they wouldn't evacuate for Sandy. With someone who works for New York City stating in a Nova documentary that the city wasn't really affected by Irene. That statement is a flat-out lie. There is a ton of misinformation about Irene, and I think it's warranted to discuss it and how it relates to Sandy. Looking through the major documentaries on Hurricane Sandy, there seems to be this common trend of underplaying Irene's impacts in the Northeast outside of what it did in Vermont. Remembering Irene as a nice little rain shower where you could go out and play in the rain. Why did I do a British accent? What? Turns out Irene was the exact opposite of that. While yes, Irene's strongest winds did not impact New Jersey and New York City, it still brought major flooding to the area. Not as major as the flooding caused by Sandy, but still, downtown Manhattan was hit with 3-5 to five feet of storm surge and caused hundreds of millions of dollars in damages in the area. That isn't nothing. Was it as extreme as it was predicted to be? No. Nowhere close to what the messaging from Irene said it was going to be. Then people forget about the flooding records that were broken in places that were not Vermont, such as in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. When I discussed Sandy with Ginger Z, chief meteorologist for ABC World News, I wanted to know what the people of the Northeast thought of Irene ahead of Sandy. This is what she told me. Yes, that was the biggest challenge in forecasting Sandy, was the juxtaposition to Irene. Because you had, and this is not something the Northeast deals with every single year, a, a hurricane that would actually come to the Northeast and impact the biggest cities. And so with Irene, that was a regular and understandable comparison. And with Irene, folks, and the way that they remember weather, I think there should be an entire book written on the psychology of weather, like how people block out certain things, how they remember other things. They'll tie something to their birthday. My husband often says it always gets cold on October 1st, and I'm like, no, it doesn't. Um, so I think we have to look at how people perceive it and, and how people want to forecast is for their direct, you know, six foot by, by three foot box. That's what people want. And that's what people expect, even though that's impossible to give on a broad, you know, and NHC or NW. WS or WABC. So what happened with Irene was even as it got closer and they got better and more fine tuned, people weren't listening and they didn't understand and they didn't, maybe they don't remember the pictures of, you know, I had been up through New England since then and you'd have these huge signs and big barns that said, um, go away, Irene, or you took our lives, Irene, you know, like it was really impactful to the New Northeast in New England, but it's as if people forgot about it. And perhaps it's because they thought that what happened in Vermont and in Massachusetts and in New, uh, New Hampshire didn't happen to them, that 
it was a it was a miss or something. So they're thinking, okay, and I'm I'm going to go back to that family in Staten Island. I spoke with a woman after Sandy who had lost her husband and her daughter in Sandy. And of course, the question she'd been asked for weeks, if not months, and I don't remember the timing of when I spoke to her after, was why didn't you all leave? You live right on the coast. Sandy's warnings were evident. They told you to leave. You were in, they were in the evacuation zone. And she said, because with Irene, we were in the evacuation zone. We left and then we got looted. So her and her family stayed in Sandy. And so they're feeling like, listen, nothing happened because they weren't there to see it either in Irene, whether there was flooding or not at their home directly. <clears throat> but they left in Irene and they got looted. So they stayed in Sandy and Sandy looted her husband and her daughter and took them from her. And so it was like this, it's a very harsh lesson of you have to, you know, you, the pinpoint of a forecast like that can't be for one house or another. That's why we have evacuation zones. That's why we have broad warning. And why just because it doesn't happen to you doesn't mean it won't happen the next year. And so I think that that she would tell you was the hardest lesson of ever in life, you know, of why one storm isn't exactly like the other, but both can do great impact to different people. Originally, I had no plans to cover Irene 2011. However, due to the sheer amount of misinformation surrounding Irene's true impact to life and property, I felt like it was necessary to cover Irene to give the true context for whatever I cover Sandy later. On the topic of Sandy, I am announcing that the Sandy documentary release date will be on October 7th, 2022. Anyways, let's finish this up. Hurricane Irene is commonly remembered for being a storm that seemingly did nothing after numerous government officials and media outlets warned that Irene would do billions of dollars in damages. However, Irene didn't do nothing, it did way more than that. Hurricane Irene is often misremembered with its impacts outside of what the storm did to Vermont and upstate New York. Hurricane Irene caused significant damage across the Caribbean islands and in the eastern United States. $14 billion in damages is not nothing. What Irene truly did was rare. The damage seen across the United States was staggering, and one of the worst natural disasters to impact the Northeast and in New England in recent memory, despite the claims that some locals will claim. Hopefully, I prove the claim that Irene did more than just nothing major with this video, as there are not many videos on this topic. If it were not for Hurricane Sandy, there likely would be a lot less misinformation and more talk about Irene's impacts to the United States. Irene's legacy is what it did at the time, not what Sandy did worse than Irene, and that's the major takeaway here. People cannot compare Sandy to Irene. Those two storms do not have a ton of similarities other than affecting the same general region of the United States. Irene's legacy may not be remembered correctly for those along the coasts of the Northeast, either because they weren't there or just don't remember all of Irene. But Irene is a storm that should not be forgotten anytime soon. First of all, as I said before, the Sandy documentary is coming out on October 7th. Until then, I have a couple more videos I'm going to work on in between those. I'm gonna first start with the Super Tuesday outbreak, then the Joplin tornado, which I am in talks with Dr. Fawn to talk about what he observed, and yes, the December 10th through 11th outbreak, you all can stop complaining about how I'm not covering it. I'm currently attempting to get in contact with someone from the Storm Prediction Center to try and hopefully get someone from there for a potential interview regarding that last subject. Those three videos should hopefully cover the gap between now and Sandy, although it may end up that I only get two uploads in between them. College starts within a couple weeks at the time of uploading this, and I am hoping to keep an upload schedule consistent considering that I am actually motivated to do these documentaries. Special thanks to all my proofreaders for this, that being Rishi and Holistic, and thank you again to Xavier Burns for the icons and track animation of Irene. Massive thank you to Ginger Z who agreed for an interview for Sandy, which I use partially here, and you will see more of her in the Sandy documentary. I am also trying to get in contact with Jay Schlatt about what he went through with Sandy because I know he lived in upstate New York at the time, and the reason why I want to get his input is that I think it would be really funny, and also I'm interested to see and hear what he thinks of Sandy. Thank you all, the viewers, for the support lately. 
we recently hit 5k and that still blows my mind that we hit the sub goal for the year that fast. I know it's been almost three weeks since I did a last upload, but uh, I got uh, <clears throat> distracted by Xenoblade Chronicles 3 for about a week and a half. By the way, play Xenoblade 3, fantastic game. A lot of people are new to the channel and the support has been immense and it really means a lot. Shout out to Montiplier who is subscribed to the Alfie's Army tier on Patreon. Those who wish to join the Patreon, which I haven't really done much for because I didn't have anyone who joined the Patreon until last week, link to that is in the description. Massive, massive thank you to Celtic White, who is the person who does all the art for the channel. Um, currently, he's working on a banner for the channel, and I just recently received a draft for it, um, which is shown up on screen here. And I, I can't really say anything else than, wow, it just blows me away. It's exactly what I was envisioning for a channel banner for the channel. Um, follow them on Twitter, they do really great stuff, and I can't really say much more besides that. I just, wow, I'm just blown away by how well this turned out. Anyways, I'm Ophelia. If you liked the video, please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, share it around, all that jazz. I hope to see you all next time when I cover the Super Tuesday outbreak. With that being said, you all have a good night and stay safe.